Hello, now we're ready now for our town hall session where we're asking, is DCE, DCE a new concept? So first, let me introduce my co-host, also from Cambridge in the UK, Dr. Jennifer Schooling, who is director of the Centre for Smart Infrastructure and Construction. Hello, Jennifer. <coughs> got six people on our panel. Uh, we've got Volker Buscher, who's Chief Data Officer at Arup. Uh, Dr. Kevin Kohlberg, AI Research Science Manager, Facebook Reality Labs USA. Uh, Professor Sadie Kreese, who is Professor of Cybersecurity at University, um, University of Oxford. Hi. Professor Sir Ian Diamond, National Statistician, UK's Office of National Statistics. Hello, Ian. Professor Emma McCoy, Imperial College London, UK, Professor of Statistics there and Interim Vice Provost. And Dr. Patrick M. Piccioni, who's Head of Formulation and Process Sciences at F. Hoffman La Roche in <coughs> Switzerland. So there's going to be a lot for us to talk about. But first of all, and can I start with Jennifer here? It would be good to hear very briefly what DC means to each of you in your field and, and really how new is it? How mature is it in your field? Jennifer, would you like to start us off? Thank you very much, Kate. Yes. Vector. Um, and in some ways, I think digital um, data centric engineering is a funny phrase because, in many ways, all engineering is data centric. You know, we've always worked with data and information and used that to inform modeling and so forth. But I think um, for me, what's different now and why data centric engineering is an important um, and useful phrase to use is that. Um, we have so much more data that we can really be data driven um, and we have much more opportunity to really understand the world around us through data that we've acquired through different kinds of sensors or through, you know, geolocated um, social media data or what have you. So there's a, a much greater opportunity now for us to draw, draw on much larger quantities of data to really understand our world. Um, but that brings with it a challenge, which is how do we manage and use that data? Um, I think in the in the built environment sector, I think it's fair to say that um, we are still somewhat in the foothills of um, adopting a data centric approach to um, the world and a, and a digitized approach to to managing data and information. Um, but we've been helped very much in, in our shift in that direction through um, what's called BIM or Building Information Modelling, which was an initiative that really got going about sort of 12 or 15 years ago. Um, and in, in the UK, at least, was very much accelerated by the UK government in 2012, saying that by 2016, it would expect all publicly funded construction projects to be utilising um, a BIM system. We call that the BIM mandate. Um, and that was very helpful because um, traditionally, construction and infrastructure management have been very paper-based, very sort of, if you like, traditional um, sectors. And um, we hadn't really embraced process control and data and automation in the same way as some other sectors, like, for example, manufacturing. There are lots of good reasons for that, um, including the fact that the environment, the physical environment that we work in is much less predictable. Um, one could argue that many of the projects we do are one-offs rather than repeated projects. Um, but because of the, the adoption of BIM, that has really driven an increased awareness in, in, in the opportunities that digital brings. Um, I think where we're still struggling a little bit is, is industries, the industry is still struggling to see the value and very much sees the cost up front rather than the long term value. Um, that could partly be to do with the way the industry operates. So, you know, we work on five year contracts, but we're working on assets that have lifetimes of decades, if not centuries. Um, so, and, and the, the return on investment in, in data might well be something that comes back in sort of 10 or 15 years time. Um, and I think the, the practical challenge for us is very much still around the, the data curation and collection. As I said earlier, we're very much a paper-based industry um, traditionally. So we're having to digitalize our data capture in order to make better use of data. Um, and that's the first sort of big hurdle to get over, which sounds fairly basic, but actually is pretty complex in our world because of the physical environment that we work in, um, you know, we, we have to handle rain and um, mud and wet water and our equipment being run over by diggers and all that kind of stuff. So um, kind of collecting and curating data is, is still a challenge. Um, but 
I do think that we are sort of accelerating in our in our adoption. And at CSIC, the Centre for Smart Infrastructure and Construction, we're working with some of the, if you like, the leading edge, the pioneers in the built environment. And I can very much see that since we started 10 years ago to today, there's a radically different position. You know, in, companies are investing in developing apps for digitally collecting data on site, um, really looking at the opportunities of using digital twins and so forth to um, to visualize data, analyze data, model data. Um, and we're even, you know, we're working with the likes of the Alan Turing Institute who are hosting this, this conference to look at actually how do we use digital twins um, and if you like the, 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 the new opportunities that are, that are offered to us by the, the increased amount of data to radically change the way that we design, construct and manage our built environment assets. And not just to do that in the short term, but obviously to think about how we do that over the long term, over a lifetime of an asset that might be 100 or more years. Um, so I think hopefully that gives you an idea of, of what it's like in the realms of the built environment to, to think about data centric engineering. But I'm sure that the next speakers will have a very different view because they're working in the Industries that perhaps have been quicker to adopt um, a, a data centric approach. Very much, Jennifer. Well, the next person we'll hear from is Volker, who is, is also involved with the uh, built environment uh, as uh, chief data officer at Arup UK. So, Volker, what, what's your take on this? What, what, what do you see? What do you think of as, as data centric engineering? And, and really, how mature is it? And what sort of opportunities are there? So we, um, <clears throat> we've been working with data for, I don't know, the last 70 years since we started as a company. Um, about 20 years ago, we radically changed towards PCs and a global network and classic sort of software applications uh, being rolled out in the business. Um, we now have about 6,000 design applications running across our 16,000 projects. And we decided that two or three years ago, this will all come to an end. So the um, move towards platforms and the orchestration of data at scale within Arup, the generation of data from the assets that we work with, um, sentient data in planning, um, earth observation data in our, in our flood management services, there isn't a single division in Arup that doesn't need to make the change from uh, files and software to data at scale. Um, so we decided to set out a program that over five years will take us from the status quo that we had two years ago to an entire new um, operating model for the company. Um, we're addressing that with five planks or five delivery platforms. Um, we look at our vision as a company for how we work with data. Uh, leadership and capacity, uh, newer business models that we need to implement, uh, a technology program called Data Infrastructure and Science, and an innovation program to develop new products, services, and partnerships. So when you move towards data at scale, you are already in an ecosystem of partners and you need to be able to manage that explicitly. And then the final part is uh, what we call uh, knowledge, culture, and practices. So again, this change from small data to the data at scale means you need different governance processes. You're running a data literacy program that has reached about 4,000 people to date to upskill all our staff. We have to review all our um, um, project procedures around residency and ownership of data and how we manage access to data. So there are quite material um, enabling changes that also need to happen in the background. The main driver is that basically we think we can do better for our clients and our staff. Um, we can just give better insights and better designs. And, and one of the big examples for that will be our work around sustainable development goals. I think it's a great example for our work. We currently work within the sort of Paris Climate Accord, and we use these as a as a sort of a lid on, on what temperature change we can get to with all our projects. So that's 16,000 projects, or what boundary conditions or input data we use in design to stay within those boundaries. But, but that is not enough. So we're now looking at much more granular carbon intensity, resilience, embedded operational carbon on, on all 16,000 projects over time, because you just, you won't be a meaningful business if you cannot operate within these new 
constraints that we have all agreed uh, in, in, in Paris. So that would be impossible to do without changing how we work with data uh, in, in a meaningful way. So that's that's where we got to. We, we felt at the beginning this might be um, something we could do or some of our divisions will do. And then when we looked in more detail, we basically found this is systemic change across the entire enterprise and all our partners and clients. That's why the DCM's program is perfectly timed as far as we are concerned. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Volker. Now, Kevin, you, you work in a completely different area. So, so what does DCE mean in, in your field and, and how mature would you say it is? Sure, and I actually can represent sort of two different fields because prior to Facebook, I was actually at the national labs in the US for almost a decade. And I worked a lot on basically simulation-based engineering design for uh, national critical infrastructure. It's actually a lot of uh, commonalities with, with what Jennifer was talking about. Um, so I'll start there and then I'll move into sort of con uh, personal uh, sort of consumer um, computing devices. So in simulation based engineering design, sort of uh, what is old practice in terms of data centered engineering is verification, validation and data assimilation, where the main idea is to leverage simulation data, as well as data that's collected in the field to improve the, the predictive accuracy of a model. And in some sense, retain the digital twin of, of various assets that are out there. So verification essentially focuses on solving the equations correctly. And that usually entails a sequence of numerical experiments to make sure that we're in the asymptotic range of convergence of all of our discretization methods. And then validation often entails conducting some physical experiments and tuning model parameters to match the computational model as close as possible to, to physical reality. Um, and so, you know, engineering practice up until, you know, maybe five years ago was basically to run the verification and validation loop get a high fidelity predictive model of an engineering asset and then use that uh, for prediction from then on. Of course, the main challenge there is that to achieve verification validation uh, certification, often we require very fine spatiotemporal resolution. So our models become extremely expensive to simulate. And in our case, we often would consume months on a supercomputer just to run a single simulation. And so we're in this situation where we have these really accurate models, but we can only run them a handful of times and many time critical applications like you know, online data assimilation, um, uncertainty quantification, where we want to do robust design, um, and any kind of like what if simulation are basically uh, intractable with with those kinds of models. So the real innovation in data centered engineering that's that's sort of I, I was a little bit a part of this uh, at the labs is really kind of leveraging data even more to make those high fidelity models much faster, such that they're amenable to uh, time critical applications. So there's this whole field of model reduction, data driven models, and um, and essentially the, the resulting uh, integration with digital twins that have really allowed us to push the envelope of what's uh, feasible to be simulated in real time. So the main idea here is we're mixing sort of what we call white box models driven from first principles and black box models that are driven purely from data to get these sort of hybrid models that leverage the best of both worlds. We get the rigorous guarantees of the white box models um, and then the sort of parsimony, uh, parsimonious nature of the black box models. Um, and so what we end up doing is using these in ca uh, cases like model predictive control, uh, real robust on uh, design optimization, where we can query a large number of uh, different configurations of, of the engineering system. Um, and now actually my new employer at Facebook Reality Labs, we're using a lot of that technology to enable very high fidelity real time interactions such that our virtual experiences are really, you know, a, a close match to reality. Uh, interesting applications there include sort of interactive experiences like training surgeons to better prepare for the operating room in VR. So that's uh, sort of the one of the domains I've worked in. The other is consumer computing devices. Um, and the team that I'm leading at Facebook is really looking to build sort of the next computing platform that will underpin AR and VR. And as I'm sure everyone here is aware, sort of the current way of using data is to do some level of personalization in phones and sort of in uh, the, the different tools we interact with. So for example, Netflix recommendations, but our next computing platform, if we're gonna have these all day wearable AR glasses. So here's a, an example of a data collection device that we're working on right now. Um, we will always sort of be immersed in the virtual and, and, and real worlds at different levels uh, and, and different, at different points on that spectrum. So we need a, a computing device that allows us to sort of seamlessly interact with digital content. It should be proactive and sort of elevate the relevant uh, content to us at every moment in time and should not get in our way otherwise. So we're investing in technologies rooted in AI that allow us to achieve deep personalization and contextual awareness such that we can sort of get go beyond this this idea of episodic use on sort of fixed uh, menu system interfaces. Um, so in, in essence, that's sort of where we're going in terms of the data set centric engineering for personal computing devices. Thank you very much, Kevin. 
Now over to Sadie, your area is, is cyber security. What, what does data centric engineering mean there and, and how mature is the field? Well, to a certain extent, cybersecurity is, of course, data centric, um, simply because we concern ourselves with protecting whether they're very large infrastructures, smart infrastructures, as we were hearing earlier, Internet of Things or personal computing devices, people's homes, their cars. We're looking at protecting assets that have a data or technology component. Um, and we're also um, considering it from the perspective of, of a malign attacker emanating somewhere from um, cyberspace. So we've always been, if you like, to a certain extent, data centric. We can see that world through a vulnerability centric lens or through a, a threat centric lens. And what I mean by that is um, we use data science to understand our vulnerability, how we might be attacked, where, by whom, what the potential for harm is, how that could propagate across our systems, trying to predict consequences and the like. Um, visualization techniques, other kinds of solutions that sit alongside um, the algorithms help us to really communicate that risk, to explore it, to understand it. And at times that's forensically after a bad event and at other times that's as part of systems design um, ahead of deployment. Um, there's also the issue of threat detection. I mean, we have to assume that things, bad things will happen. It's not possible to prevent cyber attacks from occurring to all systems and buried inside our arsenal of tools for cybersecurity operations. We do a lot of um, what looks like uh, data centric engineering and data science to help detect these threats as they're um, in flight, if you like. Um, there's also, by the way, an element of research now, of course, aimed at building trust in technologies like machine learning, et cetera, that those technologies that are involved in enabling us to better predict optimal outcomes, whether we're optimizing for people's personal experience or whether we're optimizing for re reduction of carbon footprints or resources or whatever it may be, um, there's an element of concern around how you do that ethically, whether you're exposing people to risk, whether you're exposing organizations to risk and how we can build trust in those models. And there again, um, you see some data centric engineering or some data science. I would say that the data centricity issue um, is a foregone conclusion when it comes to cybersecurity. The engineering aspect is perhaps variable. If you look back through um, history, in, in cybersecurity and, and before that information assurance and information security, data security, you'll see lots of um, application of this thinking in terms of engineering components, whether that be software or hardware. But when it comes to actually thinking about systems as a whole, um, we're beh perhaps behind the curve. It's incredibly difficult to actually deliver cybersecurity, it involves orchestration across entire systems, and I say systems in the broadest sense, so I don't just mean technology, I mean people as part of those systems. I just wanted to finish off by broadening out and thinking about some of the challenges and where we see some of the new innovations coming forward. We've heard today around uh, uh, the, the issue of smart infrastructure and the importance of it as we move forward and how we are going to radically change um, our social, economic and working environments. Um, and I should highlight to everybody the potential for systemic risk that we do face. And it's perhaps hidden at times, but as we increase our dependence on technology and data, so do we increase the potential for harm. And that increases the interest by threat actors. And so we, we have to, at the same time as investing in these infrastructures, invest in the resilience of these infrastructures and the resilience of our organizations um, and the way in which we use them. Just thinking about this, these kinds of approaches to engineering, they're not just important in how we design these systems, but they're also important to how we operate them. And it's perhaps in the operation that we face the greatest challenge and opportunity for innovation moving forward. And I'll just bring that to life for you. At the center of some of these solutions 
are what we would call deep machine learning um, assets. And they will be inside the systems as they're operating. And I can tell you that we currently have a lack of cybersecurity tools to protect them in operation. And the attack surface is broad. It's not just the design phase. It's not just the training data. It's not just the model itself. It's once it gets into operation and all the way in which it can be interacted with. That's via data, via people, via algorithms. And we will need to design um, engineering solutions that will be live in those systems to actually protect those assets, because otherwise the decisions that are based upon them could leave us open to significant harm. And so I think in reality, although we're historically and inherently data centric, um, I believe data centric engineering is going to bring about some of these new um, innovations so that we can actually deploy and operate in the face of what amounts to quite a malign threat and shows no sign of abating. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Sadie. Thank you. Raised some really, really interesting points there that I'm sure will be part of the discussion later on. Uh, so now, Ian, how about you uh, in your work in uh, national statistics? What, what does data centric engineering mean to you and, and how mature is it? Thank you very much. Um, well, as an Office for National Statistics, um, we're at the heart of creating high quality data and statistics for government. And we always have been. Uh, and therefore, data has always been clearly at the heart of what we do. Uh, and I, for the last um, 50 years, have been a statistician. Um, and what, though, the difference from where data centric engineering comes to us it is very much that we are now able to do things that we could only have dreamt about. We are able to link data together to answer questions which simply could not have been asked previously. We can use novel uh, data sets um, in a way that we couldn't, and we can use different types of data. And I'll talk a little bit about that as I move through uh, our, our, our story. But before I start, just say very, very clearly, when we talk about data centric engineering, we do not talk about, if you like, a box with wires coming out and things like that. We talk very much about a process. So our data, government data, and indeed, we often link non-government data, uh, are absolutely secure. But we are only able to use them because of the permissions that we have uh, from society and, and from government in order so to do. So we do everything um, under a, a very, very ethically sound um, piece of thinking with um, an approvals process that demonstrates things are in the public interest and using a process that we call the five safes, safe people, safe projects, safe settings, safe outputs and safe data uh, that really enable us to be able to look people in the eye metaphorically and say uh, that we are, are doing things soundly and that's been incredibly important um, during the the pandemic for example where um, we have brought data from a vast uh, range uh, of sources uh, to the national interest for example um, through surveys that not only ask people questions but in in surveys where we have collected um, from 150,000 people uh, a fortnight um, swabs uh, to test for the virus as well as blood to test for antibodies, bringing all those together and linking them with other uh, data, for example, enabling us to get the genetics of any positive test is um, something that perhaps hasn't been done by a National Statistics Institute at that scale uh, before. We've also, for example, used um, uh, telephony data to understand movement, particularly during uh, lockdowns. Uh, and uh, as we move to think uh, about leveling up, um, we are, are using textual data uh, a lot more. Uh, and just an example, um, we have a, a public health data asset, uh, which is a great example of a critical national data asset which is being used to support service design uh, and delivery. And this data asset links data from, um, from the census, from uh, COVID 
uh, data, including vaccination and test results, as GP data, it is necessary, much, much more. Uh, and uh, it has enabled us to, for example, look at the link between uh, ethnicity uh, and infection uh, and in vaccination, uh, and to understand, for example, uh, much more uh, about vaccine hesitancy, uh, and therefore uh, to 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 enable policy uh, to to take place. The other key thing is that we do not, if you like, say that uh, our data are simply ours, because they are public data. We believe they should be used. Uh, publicly, uh, and we enable access to researchers uh, working on many policy areas to enable um, new work to be undertaken. And over the next few years, we will be leading a cross-government program, which will enable us to look very carefully um, at um, many, many areas of social policy uh, and to do so in an inclusive way where all members of society have a voice in our data uh, and where, therefore, we hope, we intend to uh, be able to use those data in, a, in, in an engineering way, as I say, a, a, a systems way to be able to act positive, to enable decisions to be made which will be positive for every uh, member of society. Can I just finish? Um, by saying two things. Firstly, as, as, as was said earlier, we need to upskill all members of society in data, and we have put together a cross-government um, a, a data training uh, program, which has been accessed by ministers, permanent secretaries, senior civil service, ambassadors, and everyone, uh, in order to, to enable people to understand how a data-centric government um, can work. Uh, and the final point is simply uh, that I do think our hosts today, the Turing, are incredibly important for our country in this because by being able to, for example, to convene this meeting, the sorts of things that I could talk about will intersect, but I could learn from everything that has been said by others. And I do think the Turing has an incredibly important uh, role to play in uh, the, the whole data centric data centric engineering approach to our nation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you. I'm just keeping an eye on the time here and I'm going to encourage our last two speakers to to make sure that they are relatively brief. Um, Emma, next, can I come to you? What's what's your take on DCE and, and its maturity? So I think many of the panelists have covered some of the points that I'd, I'd have liked to have, have made. But having worked as a statistician in academia and on on you know engineering projects over the last more than twenty years, I think what has changed is that um, if I go back to twenty years ago, working on an engineering problem, often it would be a very carefully designed experiment to make sure that you had the right number of replicates to be able to answer the question robustly. Now I think we've moved where where the actual data becomes the driving force behind some of the solutions. And I think that that comes with risks. So I think that I'll talk a little bit more about those risks. Some have been alluded to already in terms of fairness. But from my perspective, I think that understanding stochasticity, understanding whether your data is robust or not, there is so much now observational data being collected. And if you're trying to answer questions of a causal nature, you're heading into very dangerous territory there. So, I mean, Kevin alluded to the kind of white box and black box approaches. And I think that there needs to be much more movement on the explainable AI and people are developing um, methodology that isn't really rooted necessarily in, in the underpinning engineering that we need to think about. So I think that we have some huge challenges in this space because of the huge quantities of data that we have and we are with those the huge data we will see correlations that we we may assume to actually answer the questions when they don't i think we also have huge opportunities to build um, and answer some very complex issues because we can now integrate data. And I think this is what Volko is alluding to in terms of having a really good platform where we're collecting data to, to build answers to these very complex engineering kind of issues. 
So I think there are some of the risks. And I think that um, the fairness one is really huge from my perspective, it, less so on the engineering side in terms of the actual applications. But I think that if we're talking about Facebook data or if we're talking about answering questions that we may that we may have on recommender systems and so on. And I think that some of these really do pose challenges. And I'm going to apologize because I'm sitting in a smart room and I've just been plunged into darkness. So this is one of the issues we have. So I'll stop there and go and turn the light on and hand back to you. <laughs> <laughs> Emma, thank you very much. Thank you. That happened right on cue. I promise I did not turn the lights out for Emma. Uh, finally, we go over to Patrick, moving from academia into industry. Um, can you share with us briefly what, what DCE means in your field and how mature is it? Sure, happy to do. So for me, uh, data-centric engineering is the combination of engineering fundamentals. So that's where the subject matter expertise comes in with analytics and data engineering methods to enable the generation of insights and importantly in industry, make better decisions. So this is not new. There is commonalities with process systems engineering, but process modeling expertise is not the same as advanced data manipulation, statistics, visualization, and so on. So why do we want to do this? What are the drivers? Well, first of all, company needs really have not changed completely. We still need to make better decisions, safety, efficiency, product quality, you name it, process reliability, cost sustainability, and so on. What's happened if we have these improvements in computational power, algorithms, uh, the user friendliness of software and data availability. So there are technical opportunities here. Using more data better, joining the advantages of empirical models with the interpretability of mechanistic models. This was also alluded to by Emma. And really in one sentence, my vision to allow computer power to augment engineers' brain power. So to join data science and engineering uh, requires three elements. Everything is up in CHRD. So strategy development, mobilizing an organization for engagement, and then delivering real valuable projects. And so the strategy bits, you need an empowered team. You need clarity of definitions, of workflows, roles, and really importantly, of expectations, so that you focus on real needs of the institution you're in. Mobilizing an organization to deliver projects here, what's really important is engagement for effective multidisciplinary collaborations. And so this is about engineers engaging with the data science movement to understand what the field offers, but also to explain their own expertise. And here, my entreaty to the engineers hearing this is make sure that known theory is actually used, that we don't just treat everything as a column of numbers with no and nothing behind it. So the next question was, how well established is this in pharma? What does it mean for Roche? And I'll think here more about the data per se, and we use it, how we use it than data-centric engineering, which is a term we're not yet using as such. So in context, our mission is to do now what patients need next. And if you think of the increasing longevity, quality, and promise of personalized healthcare, that shows you that people are expecting more and more. And of course, as patients, we're happy. That's what we do personally as well. In parallel, there's a wider trend, which is a societal embrace of a digital world, and that gives rise to really disruptive possibilities. On the research side, Roche has always been a data company running high quality clinical trials to demonstrate the value of our medicines. I personally work in a more traditional engineering domain, so pharma technical development. And here I just want to quote the vision for our pharma R&D department. We enter our data once in an electronic system aggregate them from different sources, and then transform them with ease to knowledge. Some current focus areas, so company-wide, building out our data assets and identifying new ways to have an impact with those. In research, we're now investing in new real-world data sources and looking at algorithms in the imaging space to improve outcome assessments and prognosis. We're partnering with the Turing Institute to better understand uh, patient and disease heterogeneity and its relevance to clinical outcomes. And back closer to home for me, chemistry, manufacturing controls, three main areas for the division, modeling and simulation to decrease experimental effort, automated reporting to decrease technical authoring work, and real-time monitoring to get better process understanding and thus development, better and faster. What does this require? On the projects, avoid data being the bottleneck. So 
building data repositories step by step rather than one big, huge central uh, project. Understanding the problem. So this is the data, its background, the business and scientific context, and especially the use, because that's more important than the particular choice of modeling technique. On the people side, for our patients and society at large, ethical AI research is clearly of paramount importance. As a responsible employer, we think about the impact on workforce, uh, of course, and also the positive impact. So do look at our career site because we have more digital and data roles all the time. In closing, data-centric engineering for me offers plenty of opportunities to assist and empower engineers. Computers won't replace them, but getting the best from them requires work and it's disruptive, intriguing, and really exciting work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, having heard from you all, I, I, I sense that the uh, question, is it new? The answer is, well, no, not really, but. And there are, there are lots of opportunities there that I keep hearing about. We've got about 10 minutes left in this session. We do need to come out on time. I'd like to pass over to, to Jennifer now. Would, would you like to lead? Throw a few things out there and see what response you get from, from our speakers. Over to you, Jennifer. Um, I th Thanks very much, Kate. Um, it's been really interesting listening to everybody else um, on the on the program because I think what struck me really is that there's a lot of common themes which come out, which I perhaps didn't expect coming from what I view as perhaps a slightly um, backward um, area in in terms of adopting digital. But actually, it feels as though we've all got our strengths and weaknesses. Um, and some of the words that really um, sort of sprung out to me today were. Um, the disruptive nature of um, data-centric engineering, um, that there's a huge opportunity in it, but also a whole range of risks. Um, some of those risks around things like fairness, because you know data is never neutral, how we gather and use data affects the outcomes that we get from it. Um, but then also this business of systemic risk and systems of systems, um, and that across all of our industry sectors actually we need to make sure that we've got the capacity both to, to generate, capture and manage the data, but also that we've got the, the skills to um, use that data well, not just within our organisations, but actually within society, and that we have regard to the ethics around data. So it sort of felt to me that those were common themes coming through all of our um, contributions. Um, coming from the world of infrastructure, we're very used to dealing with systems and systems of systems, because although we like as human beings to sort of segment things up and we manage our water and our energy and our flooding and all the rest of it in the same way that other industries get segmented. I think we're much more aware of the impacts that different um, sectors can have on each other, because if the energy fails, then, you know, the water system doesn't work. We can't get money out of the bank and so on and so forth. And I wondered, so do you think it was you that brought up this issue of um, the, system, the systemic risks that obviously come to the fore in, in cybersecurity and that perhaps you know, in the world of cybersecurity, you're, you're very good at data, which perhaps we're not quite so good at in the built environment, but perhaps less good at seeing the system systems area. And I wondered if you felt there was anything that we could learn from each other in that space. Yeah, I, I think you're quite right. Um, I should say in, in the cybersecurity arena, we historically, we did develop, I guess, what's akin to digital twins, really. And we, we developed lots of cyber ranges. We tried to build copies of the systems that we were trying to protect and we faced all of the all of the issues that speakers have outlined um, but one of the key issues is this and it does does answer your question um, unfortunately the difference between the malign threat and the benign threat so when we're um, engineering safety critical systems we can rely on statistically predictable failures and and reason about corner cases and, and reason about safety and accredit safety along those lines. But the malign threat's creative and it's motivated and, and it's changing all the time. And, and there's humans and organizations and international issues and um, psychological issues behind it. And that gives rise to some significant amounts of creativity that mean that when we reason about not just how vulnerable we might be to attack, but the ways in which we might be attacked, it gets quite complex. And so there is something in that. I think we, we in cybersecurity should be learning and paying close attention to all of the work that's gone on around um, uh, architecting systems of systems 
And what we can then bring to that discussion is that that creative thinking about threat and what that actually means in terms of propagation of risk. Because what we find is lots of assumptions are made about how we might have operational techniques, we might have put in, remember years ago, showing my age, air gaps, we called them. And we'll assume you can't get from one part of the system to the other. And then as soon as humans use the system, they were immediately crossing the air gaps all the time in so many ways. And then you just look at the cyber attacks in the last 12 months on supply chains. Well, many of them, are, it feels like technology, but the truth is they're actually attacking our trust. So we scrutinize less some of the ways in which we um, develop our systems because we trust our suppliers or we have processes that we, we believe and trust in. And actually the supply chain attacks are exploiting the fact that there's less monitoring and scrutiny going on in parts of our business relationships and our infrastructures as soon as we scale up. So, so it's it's actually thinking about that and layering in. Um, um, Serena talked about process. Yes, people, process, behaviours, and then thinking about that in a very creative, malign way. Yeah, I, I think there's lots more we should be doing together and. I'm convinced if we do, the answer will be in that orchestration across all these dimensions. It's never just about technology and it's never just about people. It's about both. And, and hopefully this renaissance of data centricity <laughs> that is data centric engineering is going to provide us with that mandate to really to get on with that and, and solve it. Thank you very much, Sadie. Um, that, that sort of leads me to another point that I think. Um, we only sort of skated over in some ways, but it really came up in what Kevin was saying. Um, you know, Kevin, you're now in a world where we're looking at um, sort of consumer computing devices that are, you know, we're not quite becoming cyborgs yet, but but it doesn't feel like it's very far away anymore. And of course, that raises the whole issue of ethics and how we use data and what kind of data we feed to people or get fed by systems. Um, and the extent to which those data feeds become automated and we become sort of almost victims of the algorithm. And I wondered how you're dealing with that in, and, and colleagues perhaps in, in your part of the, the sort of the sector, but perhaps in other businesses, do, do you have discussions around how you grapple with those ethical issues and, and, and kind of how that comes into the, the data centric engineering? Absolutely. So one of the key principles that we're pushing at Facebook is to build really a human centered computing device. And so a lot of these you know, important topics around privacy, security, uh, safety, and then ultimately solving the AI control problem of making sure that the machine re uh, retains alignment with our with our values are really at the center of, of what we're doing at, at Facebook Reality Labs. Um, and so towards that end, we, we've articulated a set of principles for responsible innovation that guide all of our work. And these really are never surprise people. So we should be transparent about how our products work, the data they collect, how the data is used, providing controls that matter. So basically simple controls that are easy to understand, um, being clear about like the implications involving people's choices, considering everyone, making sure that it's essentially fairness, right? Making sure that people of all backgrounds, um, including people who aren't using our products, may be affected by them are considered in, in our the development of our products and putting people first ultimately. And so we have a whole uh, different set of ways of going about pursuing those principles. We have a sort of responsible for foresight workshops internally, we also collaborate a lot with academic ethicists uh, to help the industry as a whole address these issues, as well as embedded ethicists within the team that help uh, that help guide us as we address considerations like data management, for example. Um, and so, yeah, so uh, these are basically like baked into the, even the research uh, that we do early on. So similar to how sort of cars are now built, right, with safety at the, at the core of you know seatbelts and uh, and airbags and so on and crumple zones, that's built into the basic design of the car. We're really pursuing that philosophy with all the work we're doing in AR, VR, in terms of like having those safety considerations ab initio baked into our processes. Thank you. Um, and then we're sort of related to that again. You, you talked a bit about correlation versus causation and the, the risk that's inherent in misunderstanding those two or, or misattributing um, outcomes. I wondered if you could expand a little bit on that and perhaps reflect on the impact of that on, on fairness a little bit more. You, you sort of got slightly cut off by the, the lighting system. By my, by my very you smart, from it, so. oh, great. I'm in a not smart enough room, clearly, at one of our campuses at Imperial. Um, 
Yeah, no, I think it's a really important point because despite the fact that we may say that we are putting in systems that ensure fairness, I think that um, it's it's very hard when we obviously have our own biases and all of our data also has biases, of course. So I think that becomes a very, very tricky problem to handle. I think on the correlation and causation issue, I think that that's a massive problem because obviously if you go back historically in statistics, it's all around designed experiments and randomization. And that that seems to be being done kind of less and less with the growth of this kind of observational data and the analysis of, of obs observational data. So I think that these unobserved confounders, for example, become really critical. And that, actually that speaks a little bit to the training that Ian was talking about and ensuring that that the population, that everybody, the more we use data, the more people need to understand some of the issues that are associated with interpreting data and ensure, ensuring that people really have an understanding of some of these issues because it's in the press all the time. More I'm going to have so. to ask us and to I think draw to a close. A lot of the COVID publications it, it make the same mistakes. So I think I think we do need to be really careful around robustness inter and interpretation. Uh, thank you very thank much, you very Emma, much. and thank you very much to Jennifer. Awesome I'm concerned that we do need to draw this session to a close. Clearly, there's lots of people would like to talk about. There are going to be networking opportunities on the platform throughout the rest of today and tomorrow. Um, I think, uh, thank you very much indeed, Jennifer, for, for pulling out those threads there. And thank you very much to, to all our town hall panelists. I'm glad you all had a chance to have your initial say, even though we've not been able to engage fully in conversation. I'm sure you will be in due course. Thank you very much indeed.